Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We want to welcome you to the next session of the Thur Palmer Wall Training Institute. This, this one will talk about thermography. What are we actually doing? So as we go into the uh, session of uh, As we go into this session, we're going to talk about the different uh, uh, things that we're looking at with the camera. What do they mean? So thermography is producing thermal objects or images of objects that we see every day, but we don't see what's really going on with them visually. So this object uh, will show some temperature level based on internal environmental thermal conditions that exist at the moment when we capture an image. Assuming a steady starting point, what happens to this target when we add or subtract energy? Infrared thermography is being used by industry around the world as a problem solver in maintenance programs to increase employees' safety and to help contain manufacturing costs. Both electrical and mechanical systems benefit by the use of infrared cameras to pick out problems before they reach the failure point. An abnormal hot spot is picked out. These are associated with areas of high electrical resistance or friction in mechanical objects. Finding these problems using a thermal camera will help us solve problems before a failure will occur. These cameras also help do dealing with problems involving thickness, moisture, bonding, friction, and thermal capacitance. Infrared thermography can be a fantastic tool in finding problems and learning to use a thermal camera is fairly easy. But be careful in your conclusions as serious mistakes can be made in misinterpreting what your camera is showing you. It's important to learn all the wonderful things these cameras can show you. It is equally important to recognize and understand the limitations of the technology. It's important to think about what you're seeing from this tool. The goal is to teach you how to use your camera to collect valuable information, how to interpret that information. What is the image telling you? It is up to you to determine how you can use that information to solve your problems. Using this information properly can save money and create an overall safer work environment. Heat is just one particular form of energy. Energy can be converted from one form to another. A car engine converts the chemical energy of gasoline into thermal energy, which is then converted to mechanical energy, creating motion. Also, by means of driving the alternator, this process makes electrical energy for the ignition, lights, and other power equipment, as well as charging the battery. The thermal energy conducted into the cooling system is used to generate heat for the car interior. The mechanical energy also drives the air conditioning compressor to cool the car. Heat energy is measured in BTUs or calories. This relationship can be defined exactly. One BTU or British thermal unit of heat energy equals 778 foot-pounds of mechanical energy. One BTU is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Also can be measured in calories. Uh, it's, equal, it's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree C. One BTU equals 252 calories. Now these are different than the calories in food. Uh, the calories in food are kilocalories or 1,000 of these energy calories we're talking about. One wooden kitchen match burned completely will give off about one BTU or 252 calories of heat energy. Other terms uh, for heat and energy are joules, newton meters, and kilowatt hours. And we're not going to get into these. I have the definitions here that you can look at later. Um, again, these are not issues that most of us deal with. If you're in the power industry, uh, you use these a lot. So what is temperature? Temperature is the measure of the relative hotness of a material compared to a known reference. It's really a measurement of the kinetic energy or movement of the molecules in an object compared to those in another object. The warmer the object, the higher the kinetic energy or the faster the agitation of the molecules. The amount of heat energy in an object is also determined by its mass. A cup of water and a tank of water can be at the same temperature, but the amount of heat energy contained in one is vastly different than the other. If both are allowed to cool the ambient temperature, the one with the lowest mass will cool first. Thermodynamics, from the Latin for motion of heat, is used for the study of the movement of heat energy. 
The laws of thermodynamics are accepted principles that describe the movement of heat energy. The first law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system where no energy is added or removed, total energy is constant. Nothing is lost. In essence, it's what is, is. Nothing is left unaccounted for, sometimes called the law of energy conservation. The second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, the net transfer of heat energy is always from warmer to cooler, and less work is being done to move it in the other direction. Heat always flows to cool, not vice versa, unless it's being pushed by an outside force. With the addition or loss of thermal energy, an object changes temperature. The amount of temperature change is determined by two factors, heat, specific heat added or lost, and the density of the object. Specific heat added or lost is the amount of energy required by a specific unit of material mass to change temperature one degree. One unit of measure, BTU per pounds per degree Fahrenheit. Now this is how many BTUs of energy must be absorbed or released to change one pound of a specific material one degree Fahrenheit. Other units of measure also can be used. Thermal capacitance is the understanding of different materials require different amounts of energy to change their temperature due to their specific heat and density. There's a wide variance between types of materials. A pound of air or feathers would require much more volume than a pound of wood, which in turn would require more volume than a pound of steel. Density is the mass of a unit volume of a given material. It can be stated as the weight of a unit volume of a specific material, multiplying a material specific heat times its density, we get the term thermal capacitance. The units of thermal capacitance are BTU divided by the square foot or cubic foot by degrees Fahrenheit. This states how many BTUs absorbed or released are required to change a cubic foot of this specific material, one degree F. These are some uh, common objects around us uh, with specific with thermal capacitance. As you can see, water has almost 3,500 times the thermal capacitance of air. It is the highest thermal capacitance of any naturally occurring material. This property is one of the main reasons Earth's climate is conductive to supporting life. The ocean's water acts as a huge thermal capacitor, storing enormous amounts of heat. That keeps the temperature relatively uh, even around the globe. Uh, as you get away from the equator, of course, it will get colder but that keeps the temperature relatively even so that people and animals and plants can survive. Uh, hurricanes are very destructive, but they are huge heat exchangers. When too much heat builds up in the air or the ocean, this is a way that the uh, atmosphere alleviates that and uh, evens things out. Temperature is measured in several ways, some more accurately than others. Some measure temperature by touch. That can be misleading. Try touching wood and steel at room temperature. Will they feel the same? No, the steel will feel cooler. Temperature, the relative degree of hotness or coolness, is stated in specific units of measure in relation to a known reference point. Common reference points are the freezing and boiling, and boiling is altitude dependent. Points of water, human body temperature, etc. Some reference uh, points are also the melting points of assorted metals. Common everyday temperature scales are Fahrenheit or Celsius, which used to be called centigrade. Absolute temperature scales are those that begin at absolute zero, where all motion stops. There are two absolute temperature scales that are, that are called Kelvin and Rankin, where zero is absolute zero. Celsius and Kelvin use the same metric scale, they just use different reference points. Zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero, is equal to minus 273.15 C. Zero Celsius is equal to plus 273.15 Kelvin. Both Fahrenheit and Rankin use smaller, identical, non-metric divisions. Zero Rankin is also absolute zero, is equal to minus 459.67 Fahrenheit. Zero Fahrenheit is equal to plus 459.67 Rankin. The next slide shows the number of temperature scales and their relationship to each other are used around the world. A relatively narrow band covering common temperature is shown. In the scientific world, Kelvin is widely used as well as Celsius. 
Fahrenheit is generally only used in the U.S. and the general population. The other scales are scientifically specific or geographical regional scales. Some are fading from use. So this is the relative scales relative to each other. Uh, some you're familiar with and some you may have never heard of before. And we have uh, the freezing point of here at Celsius uh, of water, and uh, you can see the relative relativity of each scale. You can use the following formulas to quickly move between the two most common temperature scales, Fahrenheit and Celsius. To convert from degrees F to degrees C, you take degrees F, subtract 32 and divide by 1.8. To convert from C to F, you multiply times 1.8 and add 32. To convert differentials in either direction, you multiply or divide by 1.8, forget the 32. In nearly all manufacturing process and general monitoring of associated disciplines, temperature is the most measured variable. There are three methods by which heat flows from one object to another. These are conduction, convection, and radiation. The major concern in infrared thermography viewers is primarily with direct radiation. The, other, the effects of the other two cannot be neglected. Conduction is the way that heat moves in a solid object, to some extent in liquids, by directly transferring thermal energy from one molecule to another. Frying pan, uh, if you have meat or vegetables in a frying pan, the, that's heated by a heat source, a fire or your stove, and that conducts the heat into the food. It's uh, what is uh, done by touch. Conduction is relatively slow when compared to the other two. Convection is a faster method of heat transfer. It's generally the way heat moves in a liquid or in a gas. Convection, the thermal energy uses a medium to carry it and, and actually develops a current in the medium to move it along more rapidly. This effect is commonly seen in buildings as heated air moves through the interior and warms it up or cooled uh, air conditioned air cools the interior. The air that is heated up moves through the building, warm as it goes, and this is faster, more powerful method of thermal transfer than conduction. Radiation, which is the transmission of energy by electromagnetic magnetic waves, is the most powerful effect. It needs no transfer medium. It moves at the speed of light, even in a total vacuum, and is observed in a way that heat transfers from glowing coals or from the sun to the earth. It's the primary way that your hands are warm near a fireplace. And this is an observation that shows all three. You get direct conduction through the pot to handle to your hand. The convection is mixing the water in the pot. The, the hot water is heated from the bottom and rises to the top. The cooler water sinks, and you have a mixing effect. And then you have the radiant heat off the fire, which you can feel. It's also important to understand what state your target is in. A steady state is a target that is generally constant where heat is flowing from a warmer to a colder object or surrounding in the same direction. In reality, there's no such thing as absolute steady state heat flow due to small fluctuations in conditions. A good example is a fully warmed up machine operating under a constant load. Transient state is when the temperatures are constantly and significantly changing with times. Examples are machines in the process of heating up or cooling down due to startup, shutdowns, or load fluctuations. Unless you understand what state your target is in, your understanding of the situation in the data you gather may be incorrect. It's important to understand the factors that affect heat transfer by conduction, the concept of conductivity and the difference between thermal conductivity and resistance. Again, conduction is the transfer of heat in the solid to a lesser extent in liquids from one molecule to the adjacent molecule. Heating up a molecule causes it to vibrate more rapidly. This transfers energy to the next molecule. This process continues until all have reached the temperature equilibrium and are vibrating at the same rate. Conductive metals also transfer heat by electron flow, giving very transfer rates. All materials have thermal conductivity, some better, some worse. 
that describe how much thermal energy is transferred over a unit area and thickness in a given time period. How much heat is transferred is determined by three factors. Conductivity of the material, the differential temperatures in the different areas. Energy will not flow from one area to another if they're the same temperature. An area size over which the thermal energy is transferred. One way this is shown is by Fourier's law. This law of heat conduction states that all the time of the rate of heat transfer through a medium is proportional to the negative gradient differential to the temperature and to the area at right angles so that gradients through which the heat is flowing. This law can be stated in two equivalent forms. The integral form in which we look at the amount of energy flowing into or out of a body as a whole and the differential form in which we look at the flow or fluxes of energy locally. Electrons in a metal transfer the heat from one particle to another further away. A simple way to describe it is heat transferred through touch. In the scientific world, this is normally done with temperatures using the Kelvin scale, which complicates things for field personality or personnel. For our purposes, Fourier's law has been translated in degrees F, which is where most of us work in this country. And it's not necessary that you really uh, understand this formula. You just need to understand what's happening with your uh, with your uh, heat transfer and materials. So you have your heat transferred, the thermal conductivity of the material, thickness of the material. Some people leave the area size out and calculate the form without it, and temperature differential. The thermal conductivity, the K in that formula, is the quantity of thermal energy that is transferred through a material one foot square in surface area and one inch thick, raising the temperature one degree F over one hour time period. So here we're 100 degrees, here is 99, and this is the amount of uh, quantity of thermal energy required to make this 100 back here. Metals are generally great thermal conductors and are used in products where heat transfer is important. Materials like cotton batting and expanded foams such as polystyrene are not good energy transfer conductors and materials with low thermal conductive, conductivity are called insulators. Their insulating factor is primarily due to the ability to trap air in small pockets. This trapped air is in reality the primary factor in the poor conduction of heat energy. This is how home insulation works. The foam or fiberglass is installed in walls to trap the air from moving around. Electrical insulators are generally good to moderate thermal insulators. The term R value, which we're all probably familiar with, or thermal resistance, is a measure of the resistance to conductive heat flow. It's defined as the inverse of conductivity, or 1 divided by K. R value is the term most people are familiar with when discussing insulation. So this is some common insulation and other materials. You can see the, the uh, K is conductive and the R is resistance. So styrene, fiberglass bats, wood, they're very poor conductors and they have a higher level of resistance where you get the copper which has a very high level of conductivity and also is an excellent transfer of electrical energy. Now, many metals are good conductors of electrical energy as well as good conductors of thermal energy. Electrical insulators are usually relatively good thermal insulators. So this is a table of common materials showing the differentials. You need to understand how the factors that affect heat transfer by convection, the concept of the convective heat transfer coefficient, learn the difference between natural and forced convection, and understand the influence of boundary layers. Convection is the transfer of heat through fluids and gases by means of molecule to molecule conduction, after which the molecules mix with one another due to pressure and energy differences. As the fluid or gas becomes less dense in relation to other molecules, around it, it rises, the cooler, more dense fluid or gas sinks. This difference is the cause of continuous natural mixing, bringing about a relatively uniform temperature. How much heat is transferred depends on three main factors, coefficient of energy, convective energy transfer, and usually that has to be determined experimentally by whatever materials you're working with. You have to develop a formula from that. That defines the rate of heat transfer for the surfaces and fluids or gases involved. The area from which the heat is transferred has exposed surfaces 
the exposed surface area of the area being transferred from and the area being transferred to will factor into the rate of transfer and the temperature differential between the two areas. The greater the difference, the faster the rate of transfer. Newton's law of cooling defines the relationship among the factors. It states the heat energy transferred by convection is equal to the product of the coefficient of convective heat transfer times the area over which the transfer is taking place times the temperature differential across the transfer surfaces. If there is no temperature difference in the two surfaces, there will be no transfer of heat. So this is Newton's law, and again, this is not something you need to worry about the formula itself. Just keep in mind what it's doing. But there are other things you need to think about, which we're going to get into now. The coefficient of heat transfer for a particular surface can be determined by sorted experimentation or using other test data and coming up with an estimate. But the value depends on the number of important things such as velocity, orientation, surface condition, geometry, and viscosity. Here we're uh, looking at orientation. The changes in age can be seen from the values of these three identical surfaces which differ only in their orientation. Consider the reasons for the differences even though all factors except one are equal. In what direction first does heat naturally travel? So you'll see the highest rate of heat flow is upward because heat rises, then the lesser amount out the sides, then the smallest amount out the bottom. Two types of convection exist, natural and forced. Natural convection is created by change in fluid or gas density. As they either warm, they rise in relation to the surrounding fluid or gas. The colder fluid or gas, being less buoyant or heavier, tend to sink. Examples are rising cumulus clouds, hot air balloons, and pouring cold cream into hot coffee or tea. If you do that, you will notice the cold cream will go to the bottom. And then as it mixes, it will come back up and mix throughout the rest of the drink. Force convection is driven by outside forces such as wind, a pump, fans, or etc. Natural convection is overpowered by these forces, which can drastically affect the movement of gases and fluids and the temperature of differentials of objects affected by them. Here are a couple of examples of a wind blowing across the surface. With a 7.5 mile per hour wind, the coefficient of convective heat transfer becomes 4. While a 15 mile per hour wind, it becomes six, not double. So why is this? In both natural and forced convection, a thin layer of relatively still fluid or gaseous molecules cling to the surface. This boundary layer or film coefficient varies in thickness relative to several factors of which the most important is the velocity of the fluid or gas flowing across that surface. The boundary layer has measurable thermal resistance based on its thickness. At slow velocities, these layers can thicken up substantially. At higher velocities, top layers are stripped away, reducing the layer thickness, and its effect on heat transfer are reduced because the temperature differential between the fluid or gas and the surface are reduced. Why is this important? The thermal temperature measurement, one of the greatest impacts on observed temperature, temperature differences on surfaces is airflow. For example, when trying to find such things as outside overheated electrical connections such as in a substation where the temperature differential between connections that are normal and those that are overheating is important to know. A 10 mile an hour wind can reduce the temperature differential by one half and a 15 mile per hour by two thirds. This can hide the seriousness of the problem. So these are uh, Beaufort's wind scale showing some uh, effects of different uh, velocity of wind speed. This is used in a lot of industries and in the weather systems and weather reporting and so on. So how can convection affect your infrared measurements? Let's list some potential common ones. When doing electrical inspections in inside of a plant, warm air flowing inside that plant might flow up and over components causing them to appear warmer than they are. Air flowing over a hot connection might then cause some other nearby components to be warmed up. When inspecting a three-phase electrical system outside, ambient air flowing over a component that is close to ambient will have little effect. But the same air flowing over a high temperature connection will drastically cool it and it might prevent you from 
uh, seeing the overheating component or understanding the level of the problem if you see it. So here's a uh, three phase connection that's uh, got one of them loose and we can uh, isolate that by darkening the camera level. We'll get into that later when we talk about setting up the camera. But you can, uh, if you have air blowing across that, it will make that hot connection, which is uh, pointed to by the arrow, appear cooler. If you have a five degree differential, it's going to appear hot compared to the other two, but that's not an issue. But if it's 50 degrees differential, then you have an issue. But if you have a lot of air blowing across it, instead of reading a 50 degree differential, you might only read a 15 degree differential. So that's why airflow across it is important. Outside building envelope inspections and roof moisture inspections can be difficult or impossible when wind-driven convection is present. The sought-after temperature differentials are blown away. So if you're looking for heat leaks in a building and the wind's blowing outside, if you're outside, you'll never see them. If you're inside uh, and the wind's blowing against the side of the building, then you'll have cold air coming in. If there's no wind blowing outside, heat on a cold winter day, the heat will go outside. If it's a windy day, then the cold will come in. The cold does not flow in naturally, the heat will flow out naturally unless it's pushed. In the following slide, if the wind was blowing around this house, you would not be able to see the missing insulation or heat leaks around doors or windows. So here we have Convective heat losses through the structure, the light area, this is thin, we're missing insulation right here under this window, so you have heat coming through. Then around the uh, window frames, we have little tiny, it's hard to see here because it's such a big picture relative to what you would normally say, see, but we have some heat coming through around the frame, so th this is a conductive loss through the structure, these are convective losses where you have a heat leak coming out around tiny little cracks. So what is thermal imaging? It's the detection and measurement of temperatures and temperature differences in target areas shown by either color differences on camera color palettes or by darker or lighter shades between black and white on a grayscale palette. Thermal imaging allows the easy inspection of such objects as hot electrical circuits, running electrical or mechanical equipment, heating and cooling equipment, building envelopes, which are looking for things like conductive and convective energy losses due to insulation issues and openings in the envelope, water leaks in the roofs, walls, and foundation, security issues, and pest infestation. Electronic equipment such as computers, environmental controls, process controls, etc., many other sorted issues. Thermal engine allows the measurement of targets that are moving or very hot targets that would be difficult to reach with a contact probe, equipment that cannot be shut down in order to take a measurement, those that are dangerous to touch such as live electrical connections, or targets that can be contaminated or altered by being touched. In simple terms, a thermal image operates like, operates like a human eye, but it's much more sensitive and powerful. It changes an invisible band of the spectrum into a visible one, allowing us to gather information which are otherwise hidden from us. Infrared energy travels through the lens, which serves to focus the infrared energy onto a detector. Wall uses a FPA focal plane detector, a matrix of detectors that sense thermal radiation and produce either an electrical charge or resistance change. The response from the detector is processed electronically to produce either a thermal image, a temperature measure, or both. Various systems, control systems allow for adjustment to control the input of infrared radiation or the output of data. These typically include adjustment of range and span, thermal level, polarity, emissivity, and other temperature measurement functions. Process data is outputted into a display screen, either viewfinder or liquid crystal screen. On the wall thermal cameras, pictures can be stored on an internal SD card or outputted individually by means of a USB cable to a computer. The thermal imagery uh, measures a very small temperature differences and our imagers will measure from a 0 0.06 C 
to a 0.1 C depending on the imager. And it converts otherwise invisible heat patterns into clear visible images that can be seen through a viewfinder or monitor. Long wavelength thermal imagers cannot see through glass, walls, or other solid objects, but can under certain circumstances detect heat as transferred through to the surface from an object behind that surface. It allows us to catch and fix problems before they cause failures, resulting in loss production, usually higher repair costs, longer repair times, and avoiding potential safety issues caused by failure. Benefits include increased safety, improvements in reliable equipment operation, longevity, potential major reductions in maintenance and repair costs, with the ability to find areas in need of repair and the ability to see if the repair was effective. And we have the ability to find problems that will create uh, unscheduled outages, uh, correctly setting up new equipment installations. If you're, set, if you're buying a new piece of machinery and you want to develop a um, pattern for that machine, a history, uh, when you first turn it on, take some thermal images of it and get a baseline and then monitor it monthly or every six weeks or every three months, whatever you want to set up and see what's changing. That way you can uh, determine when there might be a problem uh, approaching. Also, you can improve methods and quality and uh, efficient production. So when you set up a camera, what's important for proper use? The most important things that you need to know are focus. These are uh, adjustable focus, manual focus cameras. It's not automatic focus. You really don't want an automatic focus camera for this kind of thing because if you do not have a particular pattern that the camera will focus on, it will be zooming in and out. So you want something that you can get a sharp focus. Not only will you get a good image, but you'll get a much better temperature. Then the temperature range. Um, all of our cameras have optional and the, and the higher end cameras have a, a standard dual range, a low temperature range and a high temperature range. So you need to have the correct temperature range selected. The span. This is the temperature uh, that the camera sees. when You can set it on auto and everything that's in the uh, uh, screen on the camera, the, it will automatically set the span from top to bottom to cover that temperature range. You can manually set the span if you don't care about upper and lower limits, you're only concerned about a certain temperature span. You can manually set the camera only to see that span and ignore everything else. Thermal level. This is where you set your span so that you cover the target level that you want to measure. So you pick a temperature that's in the middle of the span that you've chosen if you do it manually. And you adjust that up or down so you get greater resolution because if you have a, a narrow manual span you're spreading the colors that you're using over less temperature so you get tinier differentials in color or black and white for a given temperature the measurement. Distance. It's important to understand the distance away from the target. If you look at a target and get up very close to it and read a temperature and as you back away that temperature will begin to go down even though the temperature itself has not changed. This is because the emitted energy off of the target becomes weaker and weaker as you back away from it. So the camera is seeing that differential even though the temperature is actually the same. So understand the distance you're looking at and have that on your reports. You want to get a good perspective. If you like taking photography for your vacations and so on, Move around a little bit and, and shoot your target from the best angles so you can see it, get a better perspective of it and see the problem areas because as you move around you'll see better see some hot areas than you will uh, from different angles. So good perspective is important. Correct lens. Some of our cameras have uh, three different lens selections you can choose so make sure you have the correct lens, the standard wide angle or telephoto. Then the, uh, you're looking at three different things in the image you're looking at, the camera field of view, the instantaneous field of view, and the measurable measurement instantaneous field of view. And we'll get into those in just a second. Color palette. Our cameras have 11 different palettes. Uh, all cameras see in black and white. But color is added by the microprocessor because people want color. 
So our cameras, uh, we currently have, have two black and white, positive and negative grayscale, where in one uh, hot is dark and light is cold, and the other one uh, hot is light and dark is cold. So you can choose that, and then you have various colors that you can use to bring out different things you're looking at. Minimal resolvable, resolvable temperature difference. This is what we were talking about a moment ago, where we have some cameras that have a, uh, a differential measurement of 0 0.06 degrees C between pixels. So it will pick up that small a differential from pixel to pixel. Others are 0 0.1 degrees C from pixel to pixel. Focus is the most important of the initial settings for picture quality. Pretty much all of those parameters that we talked about before, you can fix them on the software uh, later if you get it wrong. You cannot fix focus. So you got to have that done. Uh, correct focus may take some getting used to. Some people can focus better in black and white than they can in color. Look for an area with a sharp edge or a high thermal contrast. Uh, be careful when f uh, freezing an image to store on the data card that you do not jerk the camera, which might blow it, blur the picture. We have two camera speeds available. Here in the U.S., uh, we use the 30 frames per second uh, for overseas because of State Department requirements. Those are 9 frames per second unless it's an approved country. And uh, so those are more susceptible to being uh, out of focus by jerking the camera. Temperature range, that's a thermal window which you're able to look at. This is the stated range of the camera. Uh, our standard range in our instruments are minus 4 to 356 Fahrenheit and equivalent Celsius. We have a high temperature range that's 212 to 1112. So this is the temperature range that the camera will see. The temperature span is what the Im imager sees within its screen. Whatever it's looking at, it will automatically set the span to cover whatever it sees. You can switch it to manual and you can adjust that to see only a pre-selected span that you're interested in. So you, if you look at a wider span, uh, like on auto, you get less thermal detail. A narrow span will give great thermal detail, but it also can, will increase contrast or noise in the image if compressed too far. So you select the temperature span that covers all the data for the from the object you're measuring. If you're looking at a hot electrical circuit and it's 125 degrees, then you might set the camera for 140 down to 100 or 90 degrees. And that's all you're interested in. Anything above that will be saturated. It'll be burnt out white. Anything below the span that you measure will be blacked out. So uh, that's all you're interested in is the uh, what you're setting it for. Thermal level is a temperature span. It's the level of that temperature span. So if you're looking at a person's face, say the preferred temperature span would be 90 to 100 degrees, a 10 degree span. That 10 degrees could be moved up or down to different levels. So select a level that is correct for the scene you want to look at. Use that level to be the center of the span you've chosen. So the distance is important. As you move away from your target, the radiant energy levels decrease. There are also additional factors uh, such as uh, dust, smoke, moisture, how uh, amounts of water vapor, how you may fog and rain. As a general rule, a thermal imager will see three to four times further in smoke and in fog than the human eye will see. Choosing the correct, correct camera lens is important based on the size of the target and the distance of that target. Sufficient camera resolution either directly or by using a telephoto lens is needed to measure small targets at long distance. Target is addressed in the following slides. And, uh, covering large areas within a single measurement require wide angle lens, lens if space is preventing you from moving far enough back to get it all in. Wide angles are generally used for uh, building energy measurements where you're scanning an entire wall in one shot. You want to get it all in. Perspectives doing what is necessary to get a clear uh, direct line of sight to your target. You want to move around until you get the best thing. It's also uh, need to be aware of air movement over your target, how that will affect it, and maybe 
with doing something to block air movement if you have the ability to do that. And these parameters that can't be corrected by the software are the things you remember by using the word forward. Focus, range, you have to have the correct temperature range selected, and distance, you need to understand that and have the correct lens chosen. All other things can be fixed in the software. If you look at a single point thermometer, the uh, target is a circle. If you look at a single point thermometer, the uh, target is a circle. The further you get back, it's like a flashlight on the wall as you back up, the target gets bigger. So uh, this unit is measuring everything in this circle. Many people believe when you pull a trigger, you got a laser dot that goes out. They think that's bouncing back and you're reading a laser dot. All that is is a pointer. This, the infrared energy is being picked up by the image. It needs no pointer or nothing from the imager or a thermometer to read that other than it's collecting the data. There's a parabolic mirror in here. It's, the energy is coming off the target. The parabolic mirror concentrates it on a thermopile, which is a cluster of specialized thermocouples, and that uh, generates electrical signal, which is read as a temperature. So you make, want to make sure that the circle is filled with your target. So this is best, get a little leeway around it, but this is okay, but you've got to make sure it's filled. If you're doing this, and the target is smaller than your circle that you're measuring, you're going to pick up whatever's behind it, and that's going to average into your circle. So the smaller the spot size, the better. If you're looking for an average of a larger area, this will give you an average, but you need to make sure that you're filling the circle with the target you want to measure. Thermal imager, instead of having a circle, has a grid-like pattern. There's a bunch of pixels in the array. Each pixel is measuring the temperature totally independent of the others. So we have these pixels. Here you're too far away from your target and you're not even filling up a single pixel. This is still not good enough. This is okay for your uh, single pixel. But this is only observable once the image is downloaded to your computer. Because individual pixels can go bad, all thermal camera manufacturers use a block of pixels for the cursor temperatures on the camera. The field of view is the total area seen by the imager with a specific lens. The Z30s and Z50s have a field of view of 17 and a half degrees wide by 13 degrees tall. The Z70 is a field of view of 25 wide by 19 degrees tall. The instantaneous field of view is the instantaneous spatial resolution or the smallest object that can be seen by the system at a given distance. The most common unit of measure for thermal cameras is mill, milliradians. A milliradian is 0 0.057 angular degrees. There are almost 6,300 milliradians in a circle. The instantaneous field of view is the angle per pixel in milliradians. The Z30s and 50s use a smaller wide or narrower angle for the same number of pixels. So this is a 17 and a half degree field of view. The milliradians is 1.9. So that gives a field of view of 526 to 1 with the standard lens, 1052 to 1 with the optional telephoto lens, and 263 to 1 with the optional wide angle lens. The array is a 384 by 288 array. That gives a milliradian of, of uh, 1.13 for the image itself. The Z70, the array is a 384 by 288 array. That gives a milliradian of, of uh, 1.13 for the image itself. So the image for the uh, image downloaded to your computer will give a distance to target ratio of 885 to 1. So the instantaneous field of view measurable is the smallest target that you can reliably get a temperature from. 
because individual pixels can drop out. The cameras all measure the block of pixels as we showed before. We went through those. We used that five pixel block. Fluid Fluke used a nine pixel block. So this slide shows us uh, what we're looking at through the camera. The field of view is the windshield view. That's everything in the image that the camera sees, everything that's on the screen. The instantaneous field of view is the smallest target that the imager will record. You cannot see this on the screen of the camera. This is what you can see once it's downloaded. This is the smallest target that the imager will see from in one pixel. The instantaneous field of view measurable is what the imager sees in the block of pixels we talked about. This is a five pixel cross on the 30s, 50s, and 70s series. This is the smallest target you can see live as a temperature reading on the on the cursor itself on the temperature on the uh, camera screen. But you can see each individual pixel once it's downloaded to your computer. So the 30 and 50 series for 526 to 1. Ideally, if possible, for three times closer on the 50 and 30 series, actually on the 70 also, to get a reliable temperature measurement. But you can get the individual ones once you download it to your computer. So again, here is the uh, field of view. Our 160 by 120 have 19,200 pixels in the array. A 320 by 240 imager has 76,400 pixels in the array. Our 384 by 288 has 110,592 pixels, which is almost 45% more pixels than a 320 by 240. So we'll get a much sharper image once you download it on the computer, but you won't be able to see it on the screen. So each individual pixel, that's the instantaneous field of view. We talked about the smallest thing that we'll measure. So that's what you can see once you download it to your computer. So this is the block of pixels being measured that are live. This is what the cursor shows. So this is the smallest target you can see live on the camera and get a temperature on. So thermal cameras actually see in black and white. Uh, thermal cameras are in uh, see in black and white. The colors are added to uh, just for the customer's uh, desires, people want to see in color. Uh, grayscale, positive grayscale, the temperature goes from lightest to darkest in relation to target temperature from hottest to coldest. And the color can be said, iron or iron bow palette. Uh, cold is uh, dark, light is hot, so that's the ones that most people use. And that's uh, quickest, best for quick judgments where you're not having to worry what color shows up. Uh, the Noise equivalent temperature differentials the sensitivity of the camera, and uh, we stated in millikelvins, uh, millikelvin, 100 millikelvins is a tenth of a degree C. Uh, we also have imagers that are 60 millikelvins, 0.06 percent degrees. When you're taking images of a target uh, for storage on the data, it's most important to have some identifying mark on it. And the camera has the ability to record live voice up to 45 seconds with each image. So you can describe what you want and a tag number and so on. So uh, we can give you both a digital and thermal image with the 45 seconds verbal description. And that will give you uh, important data and you can play those on your computer. So that's all for today. Any questions?